everybody, Susan Finch here, and today I'm wearing my hat as an interviewer, not just the founder of Binky Patrol, which is how I met our guest. Binky Patrol makes blankets for kids that are ill and abused, and we give them away. And if you're a sewer or a quilter, I've been told I'm a sewer, not a quilter, <laughs> but I like high quality fabric, and there is none better than Hoffman's, and their boutiques and all these other things have intrigued me enough over the years because, well, I met them. I met our guest uncle, Tony Hoffman, 25 years ago when I first started Binky Patrol. And not only did he give me the most intriguing story, but he gave me a tour of where the magic happens, where the fabric is made and designed. And I know that there's a big history to this because I know that Tony is an avid surfer. And that's kind of what kickstarted all of this. So I would love for Haley to come on. I'm welcoming Haley. And she's going to tell us all about the history of Hoffman's. And we're going to have some other chit chat. So here we go. Hey, Haley. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm so glad you could join us today or join me. There's no us. <laughs> I know. <laughs> kind of funny. But um, yeah, like you said, my name is Haley. And I am the fourth generation of the Hoffman family that has now um, been working at the, fa at the fabric company and, and my great grandfather Rube Hoffman started Hoffman Fabrics in 1924 um, so 96 years ago now and um, he started selling wool to department stores in downtown LA um, so at the time we were selling mostly solids plaids um, a lot for garments, so dressmakers, the lining of wedding dresses, things like that in the garment district and in the fabric district in downtown. And then um, after my grandpa and his brother, they kind of grew up just knowing that that's what their dad did, but they surfed and went to school and everything. And then so, um, my grandpa, he was in the Aloha Prince and his brother came into the business around the same time and really got into the retail side selling fun prints over the counter to fabric stores. Um, so they kind of both had their own niche within the business. My grandpa headed up the manufacturing side for garment in the surfwear activewear industry, Aloha Prince, and his brother, Philip Hoffman, or Flippy, he did the quilting, or what ended up being the quilting side, the retail side of the business. So there's kind of been two divisions. And then, like you said, my uncle, Tony, he's been at the business since he was um, a teenager, essentially. And yeah. then my mom started, I think she's in her 27th year, maybe. Um, and she, so Tony is the president, um, CEO, and my mom, Robin, is the CFO. So she does all of like the internal stuff. And then um, Flippy's son, Marty, works at the business and he spends um, half of his year in Bali at our factory. So Oh, how cool he, is that? Yeah. So he actually married a lady from Bali that's native to Bali. And so she, they split time between SoCal and Bali. And then Aaron and I, Tony's son is Aaron and Aaron's my cousin. And Aaron and I are now the fourth generation. And we kind of oversee pretty much everything, not so much the manufacturing because we have an amazing um, uh, president of manufacturing, Tammy, that's been with us. She's been like my grandpa's right-hand girl since she was like 17. And Aww. she's she's in her like 40th year or something with Hoffman. So, um, but yeah, Aaron and I are in the office every day and at Quilt Market every year and all of those things. So it's been fun, but yeah. Um, I guess we have like certain sectors of the business, meaning we do the manufacturing still, a lot of Aloha prints, um, the Magnum PI print is a famous one, um, things like that. And then within the quilting industry, we kind of have our boutiques, which happened in the early 70s. So we were the first to bring boutiques to quilting. Now, and so let's let's tell people though a little bit about, people think they know what a boutique is and what makes it a true boutique. And there yeah. are a lot of imposters out there as I run across all the time. People donate fabric to Binky Patrol and some of the boutiques we get, it's like, it's printed on one size. Like, That's not boutique. Right. Or the quality isn't nearly as good as what I get from you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Boutiques are um, very, very particular. So boutique is the word boutique is just the process in which the fabric is printed or dyed. So it's all hand dyed and the art of batiking is using a copper stamp or copper chop dipped in wax and the wax creates a dye resist and then the print comes through when you dye it again and boil off the wax and all of that. So batiking is like the actual art form and the art form is from the island of Bali within Indonesia. So not Indonesia in general. Um, so 
in order to be like what you would consider a traditional boutique, it needs to come from the island of Bali, which is where our factory is. So many, many companies are selling boutiques that they're buying from Jakarta and other places in Indonesia, which of course now they can do, you know, anybody can do it. You could do it here and call it a boutique. Um, but really it is the artisan type of art that they do in on the island of Bali. And then, um, yeah, like you said, it's not printed, it's dyed. So there should be no wrong side to the fabric. Right. Um, and but, then, but don't your, um, you were talking to me be, before we've visited a few times, your artists, some of them, I mean, it's a very guarded secret yeah. and technique for some of the colors and you have some rare ones. Yeah. So we own our factory in Bali. We partnered with a, a friend over there in the seventies and even within our factory, which we technically, you know, run and fund and everything, there's different like teams of batikers and they're all their own little like family business, like the father, the son, the uncle, the cousin, and their color formulas are proprietary to them. So they don't share their colors with other batikers within the same factory even. So when we say that we want this flower to be in the color that we call Vegas, which is bright purple. It goes to a particular person that makes the Vegas color. Um, and like our, like black, we call it Raven. And it is done by one set of batikers that know the color formula and only done like on certain times of day based on the weather. So um, yeah, the dyes are reactive to the sun. So it really is an art form and a science and they are very, very serious about not sharing that. <laughs> uh, that just makes it so much more interesting to have your fabrics. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have Hoffman Raven, it's super special. Uh, if you see like any of the colors, they are like somebody put a lot of time and effort into making the color just right. I love that you guys all know these families. You're not just outsourcing, you are partners with them. Yeah. And they become part of the whole Hoffman family, even that far away. I just hear it in the stories from all of you that these folks are like part of your everyday lives. Yeah, the 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 fatigueers there and the team and everybody. I mean, there's a team within like their office that does quality control and counts the yards and everything. They all call it the Hoffman House, and that's just what it's called. I so that. I think they probably tell people that they work at the Hoffman House. So I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. They probably have a little bit of prestige with that too, because you guys have yeah, some maybe. integrity, history. I've always appreciated that behind everything that you guys do is still fun. Yeah, you incorporate yeah. that I mean, surfing drove a lot of this. Yeah, exactly. Like our whole family um, pretty much revolves around surfing water. My grandpa swam in the Navy over in Hawaii, which is how he got into surfing in Hawaii. He surfed in LA, but really got into big wave surfing over there. And then, um, yeah, our whole family surfs, lives at the beach. That's it. That's kind of it. And we're all involved in all of the art meetings and designing. So oftentimes you'll see like tropical groups from us and that's like what we love to look at and wear and quilt with. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really fun. Talk to me about the collections because your offerings in the last, I'd say four or five years have really evolved. Yeah. With different printing techniques, I'm seeing full screen prints of wildlife with so many wonderful complementary fabrics that go with it. Can you tell me a little bit about those artists and how you find them? Yeah. So um, it was in 2015 that we started digitally printing fabric. So that kind of opened up like a just uncovered a lot of what you couldn't do previously. Previously, you were restricted to 18 colors and a 24 inch screen bread. So that's as big as your design could be. And you could only use 18 colors. So you had to use them wisely if you wanted a print that had a lot of different elements in it. Um, now with digitally printing, I can like, just like you do off the internet, when you print something on a piece of paper, you can print anything and it looks exactly like it does on the computer screen. So um, with that transition, it kind of, made sense that we needed artists that could both start from, you know, they paint something and then they scan it in and they manipulate it that way. But we also have artists that are photography based that we license nature photographers and stuff so that um, them and our artists can team up and kind of like morph hundreds of photos together to create something that's just like so complex and so original. Um, so we have, I think we have like eight artists in house currently um, that mostly work on the computer and computer programs. A lot of them start a collection um, 
with their own paintings and then scan the painted elements in and then create a collection that looks like watercolor paintings, but they've done it in the computer. And then we have licensed designers from the outside too. Now I come from, I had an art gallery years ago in Laguna Beach and it was just when Giclés were starting. Okay. Uh, the Giclé process, which is a dot printing. I mean, uh -huh. it's like an inkjet printer, but high quality. Is it similar to that? It is. Yeah. So um, it is similar. It's it, the dyes are from Switzerland just because they tend to be better dyes. And then, yeah, it's, it's really similar to your computer printer. And then there's a, like a heat setting process after. So um, there is, I guess, a difference in digital printing. Like if you were to, uh, there's a, you know, company, there's hundreds of companies now, I'm sure, but Spoonflower is a big one for sewers and quilters where you can go on and kind of like they print on demand or you could submit your own design and they print it on fabric for you. And that is a different type of like digital printing. That would be like pigment printing where it's just sit, sitting on top. Um, this form of digital printing that we're using, the dye actually goes into the cotton and it then has to be heat set. So it's finished. It's super soft. It's not crunchy. Right. Um, all of that. So I guess it is pretty complex in the sense that there's multiple processes and you have to have this whole finishing process, which is millions of dollars of equipment and heat and steam and all of these things. Um, but digital printing, essentially, when you're thinking of it, is like printing on your inkjet printer. Right. Just a whole yeah. lot a yeah. whole lot more sophisticated yeah. <laughs> and, and durable. And yeah, yeah. And I mean, I can't even imagine the process of making, like, making sure the fabric doesn't move through the printer at all. Like, you know, it, it's so soft and pliable. So That's the thing. Your fabric is super soft that you're printing on. Yeah. The panel printing has been around for a long time. I remember the old calico prints and the little pounds of the teddy bears, all that kind of stuff. And it was always stiff. Yeah. And a lot of the others that I see out there at the different fabric stores, it's stiff. It does not, even, even if you wash it first, it still doesn't have that same quality or durability in the colors. It doesn't last as long. Right, right. So yeah, anything like that probably isn't finished. Um, it's hard to say, like, I don't know who it's coming from yeah. and stuff, but really the finishing process is like definitely key. Both, I mean, really the printing is printing no matter how you do it, but like the goods that you start with, the base cloth that you start with and the finishing process make the biggest difference. So we've always used the highest quality cotton in the beginning and the tightest weave and finest thread. And then it always is finished at the printer. So those make a big difference. You'll notice like right away, if you like have something from Spoonflower and have something from a quilt shop with, you know, a big manufacturer's name on it. There's a big difference. What, when you started to transform all the, to digital printing and things, you also, your up, your website updated a ton and yeah. you started offering what, and it's not unusual. There are a lot of companies that offer kits and clubs and things like that. Mm -hmm. But you're the one thing that I remember going all the way back is the Hoffman challenge. Yeah. <laughs> and and I know you have, you know, there's going to be some nuances to that. And we'll talk about the trunk show in a minute. But can you tell everybody about the Hoffman Challenge? Yeah, the challenge is the, our, our Hoffman Challenge is the longest running quilting challenge to date. So we're in the 32nd year now. Um, and it started back with actually some local guild members to Hoffman Fabrics. I don't know if it was like an Orange County Guild or San Diego Guild, but they were local to us. And they knew, at the time, they knew somebody that worked for us. Um, and they stumbled upon a piece of Hoffman fabrics for, in a quilt shop that they thought was particularly like um, maybe unusual and difficult to use in a quilt. Like they weren't sure how they would use it. They, I, I'm sure they thought it was ugly at the time. Whatever it was, they were like, this is impossible to use in a quilt right now based on what they knew at the time. And they took it to their guild and they decided that they were going to challenge every guild member to like create something with this awful fabric. And so we kind of like partnered with them. I think maybe we like sponsored a prize or something. Okay. And um, we were like, well, that's actually a pretty good idea. Like, we, I mean, we don't mean to make fabric that's hard to use, but we should challenge people to use our fabric in a certain way. So um, that's kind of how it was born. And then, yeah. So nowadays we have a collection that, um, we deem is the Hoffman challenge collection for the year and they have to you have like I think between once the fabric delivers I think you have six to eight months to make whatever you're going to make and then nowadays you submit it digitally first and we review and then the finalists get asked to send their piece to Hoffman and then there's a panel of judges that the curator brings in um 
quilters, pattern designers, shop owners, things like that. And they um, judge them. And then after judging, they get split up into different chunks. Usually we have about like 12 different chunks because there's quilts, both modern piece applique and mixed. And then there's garment accessory. So um, we have all the trunks and then um, fabric stores, fabric or quilt shows, quilt festivals, libraries, museums, guilds, they can all go on and reserve a trunk show. And then they would set up the trunk show, display it for however long they want, and then it gets sent on to the next place. So that's kind of the whole year of the Hoffman Challenge. <laughs> that's a lot. And so you have an archive on your website, of course, with the past winners going back quite a ways. Um, yeah, so the curator used to create an actual physical book of winners for the year, um, which got to be something that like our current curator just couldn't, like the, it's a full-time job and yes, it is. We, we just couldn't do it. So we decided that nowadays we'll just put all of the winners on our website. So you can go to our website and see all of the winners and all of the categories. And there's a bunch of categories because Aurafil is a co-sponsor. So there's even like thread categories, things like that. So um, yeah, you can see all the winners on our website and then I think we post, I'm not sure if we post all of the finalists on our Facebook, but I know we first are on the challenge Facebook, but I know we do post the winners there too. So a couple places for people to like share to their family and friends and show them, show them what they did. But That's I mean, that's a, it's a fun thing to review. I love getting the emails when it talks about it and the winners start to be announced. I yeah. never enter it. I am <laughs> not that skilled. I am, you and I talked about, you don't sew. You are no. not a quilter. You can do straight lines if you had to. Yes. And that's yeah. about where I am. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've been doing all sorts of things. With Baby Patrol, we make very simple strip blankets at our events so that right. we can jam out 300 blankets in five hours. Exactly. I mean, that's our goal at that point. But some of our folks, I mean, when we started it, I had no skills that, well, yeah. I had skills at the seventh grade level, maybe. Right. My mom used to make some of my clothes with bric-a-brac and stretchy knits in the 70s, but <laughs> that was about it. So to be introduced to the world of rotary cutters and mats and cutting mats and straight edges and things like, wow, I used to use a pen and a cereal box to yeah. make patterns. And you do what you can, but now I've learned so much more. It makes it a lot more fun. Yeah, yeah. And the I, more you learn, the easier it gets. It does. The tools are expensive though, man. Yeah, they really are. We, in our like kitting department, and I just know how to cut fabric because I've had to for kits and things. So like I now know what a fat quarter is and how to use the rotary cutter and things <laughs> like that. But, but yeah, the, I mean the cutting pads or mats, the rotary, like, and when you're doing a lot, I mean, I can't even imagine the store's expenses just because they're cutting fabric all day often. So yeah, it's, right. it adds up quick. It does. So let's talk about your, I know you do have a few clubs and you have at least one for the boutiques. Yeah, we do. So we offer a club to stores, which consumers could find in their local shops. Um, kind of two different versions, but similar idea. So each month there's a bundle, a fat quarter bundle, and each bundle has 12 fat quarters in it. And it's colored by the season. So February is pink and red and March is um, green. And then you can, the stores can choose to either do all 1895, so our like watercolor solid, or boutiques, meaning that they have designs on them, different shades, all of that. So um, yeah, those bundles are really, really fun. And then our third kind of like program club type thing we do is our palette of the season. So three times a year with each of our releases, um, we, do you want me to stop? I don't know. Okay. Oh, there you go. Yeah, those are 1895s. Yeah. Awesome. So those are our like solid. So we have 375 colors of our H95 um, and they are a watercolor basic that is right. in hopefully every quilt shop these days. It's been around for a while, but then, so our third club uses H95s only. So three times a year we have a palette of H95. So there's 12 different colors within the palette. And then we have a, a, a quilt um, pattern designed exclusively for us. So we own the pattern. And what we provide to the shop, it, beyond the 12 bolts that they purchase, we give them a free shop kit. So the fabrics in the quantities they need for free to make the free pattern. So they, they can get out the free pattern to their customers. Um, so that's been really fun. There's been some really fun quilts. The first one was like citrus and oranges, lemons. 
And then the second was a table runner or a wall hanging of wine bottles. And then this third one is more of like a Aztec star. So Ooh. lots of different techniques and different ways to use H95 color combinations that you might not have put together in your shop. Very cool. Yeah. So with, I mean, right now, this video will be dated at some point because this one segment we're going to talk about with COVID and the change in moving things around, everybody's thinking of new ways to do what they used to do. So your trunk shows, I know having done trunk shows for other, with other people like clothing designers and things, uh -huh. there's a lot of work and expense to get these things to travel around. And I know for you guys, it isn't about making a profit from that. Your whole thing is to get exposure and brand exposure. Right. Exactly. Which is great. And to introduce people to a new creative craft maybe and inspire them. Mm -hmm. So exactly. knowing that, and now that we're all thinking of new ways to do things, what are your plans? Are you considering doing an online trunk show where the artists could actually speak or? Yeah, I actually talked to our curator um, a few days ago just cause they're like it, it who knows if, you know, guilds are going to get together in person or shops are going to, you know, even have the extra, I think it's like $75 for a trunk, but stores right now are just trying to reopen and make ends meet. So, and then who knows about quilt shows like quilt festival and stuff. Um, at least for, or quilt market, I should say, was canceled in spring, of course, but who knows what's going forward with other quilt shows in smaller shows and, and county fairs and things like that in the summer. So we talked a lot about it and we haven't decided yet because there's still some time before the trunk show would start, right. but um, there is an entry fee and the entry fee goes towards the time it takes to create the trunks and all of that. So we feel that if there is no trunk show, then maybe it would be best if we give back the entry fee since it's all digital. It takes a lot less time, a lot less money to organize and ship everything. So we're trying to figure out if we, um, if we do switch to a digital model that we should probably reimburse the artists and then figure out a way for them to submit video um, content to us to kind of like curate. But it's a great idea. I think it should be done regardless. It does. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> So let's tell everybody how to learn more about Hoffman Fabrics, how to find you guys. Okay. And if you were to challenge everybody with one thing, what would you ask them to do? Oh gosh. Um, well, to find us, you can go to our website. It's just hoffmanfabrics.com. Um, our Facebook is Hoffman California Fabrics. Our Instagram is at Hoffman Fabrics. Um, lots of like super inspiring, fun, creative things to do there. And I guess if I were to challenge somebody that's interested in quilting, I would in, like encourage you to go to our website because I think that our project catalog for every season is super inspiring. I know stores keep it for years and years and years because there's a hundred pages of quilts with the information on exactly the fabrics used and the pattern and the designer. And it gives such exposure to quilts, quilt pattern designers that you might not know or see in shops. Um, and that, that catalog alone is honestly could be like a Bible for a quilter. Like you could find one project after another, just going through them, whether you end up using our fabric or not, it's more about the patterns that are in there and like the amazing pattern designers that, you know, who knows if anybody even knows who they're, they are because they're so busy creating that it's only ways like this, that they kind of get into the, store owner and the consumer's hands. Um, so those, if you just go to our website, go to catalogs, you'll see our project book and there's one for every season. And it, it's just like, I look through them and I don't even quilt. And I think that it's like amazing. <laughs> so that's what I would encourage you to do. And then I guess otherwise, like right now, I feel like the mask making thing is going crazy. So yes. if you have a little bit of a stash and some extra time, maybe hand some masks out to your local, your just your neighborhood even neighborhood to senior centers. Yeah. yeah. I even um, talked to somebody the other day that was going to just drop them off at the jail. And I, I mean, I don't like, you just never know. You don't. Who and I, I had a family at our church and they had a bunch of fabric that we had in storage for Binky Patrol. So we're not having a big event. So my kids need something to do right now. So yeah. my family went and they made 150 masks. Yeah. Hoffman fabric. Yeah. And they delivered them to our at home, the homebound people at our parish. Uh -huh. And then the rest, one of our chapters in Connecticut, she said, we still need a ton. Yeah. Said, 
we don't have enough in the hospitals and we have smaller hospitals that gave to the big hospitals and now they need it. Yeah. And like the senior living centers, it's been, it's like really amazing to see how many people are making masks and just donating them. And the other thing that I think is like the coolest is teaching. Like I wish I would have learned at a young age because you end up being better at it. Like teaching your grandkids or your kids to do it with you. And then they know all of a sudden they know how to sew. Right. Uh, like three masks in and they're experts and they can do it with their eyes closed. So I think that's huge. Just teaching, teaching as many people as you can. So I think in the, when you teach them, walk, think out loud. We take a lot. If we sew a lot, we take a lot for granted on what we're working on. Right. Remember to tell them the steps. We're folding it because of this. We're adding right. it because of this. We, you know, do it double because of this. Right. And then I just received though, this is really cool. <laughs> I have to show you one of the a company that I buy some of our shirts from is in Hawaii jams. Yeah. That's oh. actually like our fa- One of our family's best friends. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Dave that's- Rockland, Dave Rockland who started jams started it with my grandpa and they were best friends. Dave Rockland is no longer here, but his son Pua is like my mom's brother. And like, yeah, they're like our, when we go to Hawaii, we stay with them. They're the best. They are. And what I love is when I contact customer service, I have a person who actually writes a note. Oh, hey, Susan, blah, 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 blah. And they get to know us, but they may. Yeah. They took, their, they took all their cutaways. Yeah. The manufacturers, and they put a little filter. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that they were doing that. I talked to Heather, who was wife the other day. And yeah, amazing. So awesome. It is. So, I mean, super cool guys, designer masks from yeah. Jams. And it, you they're, know. so they, um, uh, all their shirts are hundred percent rayon crushed rayon, which is yes. why they're so comfortable, but yeah, super awesome. So I pants from them, dresses. I mean, yeah. I want to lift. I buy jams. Yeah. Jams is the best. That's so <laughs> funny. Yeah. They're like, we, I mean, my grandpa helped start and get them going and we did their prints for forever and we still do some of their prints and yeah, they're who was in our office a couple times a year, just hanging out. Stays How cool them. is, I, I love it when we connect like that. Yeah. Yeah. Jams <laughs> is the best. That's awesome. <laughs> So let's go to hoffmanfabrics.com and you yeah. can find all the ways on social to connect with them there. Yeah. The pages, sign up for their newsletters. You will get inspired. You will have all sorts of wonderful ideas that come your way and announcements before anybody else of new fabrics and patterns. And I'm, I'm waiting for one right now to finish a quilt that I started. I am a straight line quilt person. Yeah. <laughs> and so a new pattern that I'm using all the time. I'm enjoying because it's just straight lines all cut from fat quarters. That's awesome. So. Once that arrives, I'll be able to finish my daughter's quilt to send her off to college. Nice. Yeah. Cool. A lot of purple. A lot of purple. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Where is she going? Grand Canyon University. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Super awesome. excited for her. Yeah, that's great. So I'm going to make one side that's not so colorful and one side. <laughs> but- yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, I am so glad you came back and joined us, Haley. We had a wonderful event last week when we did our Binkathon online. And I think just everybody hanging out in the room for the day had a blast and it was such a treat and more people that were listening. It was you that they all wanted to see more of. They said, <laughs> and they went, I had four people contact me saying after watching and hearing that story, I went and bought Hoffman fabric. That's awesome. So they were really inspired. So yeah, keep it up. thank you guys for being a part of Binky Patrol for all these years. I am so grateful for yeah. your generous heart of your uncle and his enthusiasm and the love that you guys have for what you do and how you live just spills into everything that yeah, comes out of thanks. that factory. Yeah. We're, we love being your guys' partner. So it's awesome. Thank you so much. We will talk to you soon. This is Susan Finch. And my guest is Haley. Do you go by Maltz or Hoffman? Hoffman for work, but I'm married to a guy named Ryan Maltz. <laughs> <laughs> to a guy named Ryan Maltz. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Thought, you know, which one do you want me to say? So Haley Maltz of the Hoffman family. Yeah, an origin, and part of one of the, my favorite fabric companies in the entire world. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh-huh.